Welcome to How to Carve a Wooden Bowl, part six. It's been about two weeks since we initially carved the bowl. And today we're gonna to talk about the finishing cuts as well as the drying process and what finish or oils to put on your bowl. So our bowl's been drying for about two weeks now and the drying process is a bit finicky and worth a discussion. Since we carved these bowls green, during the drying process, you have to be careful not to develop cracks in your bowl. Let's take a minute or two and just learn how wood dries and how it changes as it dries, so that way we can use the strategies to prevent cracks in our bowl that we worked really hard on. In order to do that effectively, I think I'm going to have to draw some diagrams. So let's say we have a log that we've split, so we have two halves of this log. And the pith's here, and we have these radial growth rings. Now the wood's composed of fibers that run in this direction. And when the logs cut, it cuts through those fibers. So we generally call this area where the fibers are cut the end grain, and these areas where it's just the side of the grain, the side grain. So the first thing we should know is that where the end grain is exposed, where it's cut, is going to dry much faster than the side grain. And the second thing to know is as wood dries, these little fibers get smaller and so the wood shrinks. And generally how you're going to see that shrink is these are all going to come closer together. This height's going to get a little smaller. But the overall length of the wood isn't really going to change. So assuming the entirety of this log could all just turn dry all at once, what it would transition to is a log where instead of this being flat, these sides have come closer together and it's just slightly less tall, but it's about the same length. But the problem is the log doesn't all dry at the same rate. It dries at the end grain first and the middle of the log tends to stay wet. So the end grain portion of the log gets smaller but it can't contract like this and so what ends up happening is in order to accommodate this shrinkage you end up just getting cracks or voids in the wood. So with our bowl here the end grain is over on this section where the handles are and the side grain is here and this end grain portion is drying faster than the side grain and so it's trying to shrink and this side grain if it doesn't dry at the same rate is not allowing it to shrink and you end up with cracks usually on the end grain portions. So there's a few strategies that are used to try to prevent cracks from forming in your bowl and one of those strategies is to make sure that the wood stays as wet as possible while you finish the carving process. So you saw in the previous videos, the bowl was kept in a plastic bag between carvings because oftentimes I can only carve on the weekends. So I would do some carving, put it in a trash bag, and then just leave it in a cold location until I could come back to it. You want to keep it green until you've carved it down to a relatively thin walls because that'll do two things. One, the thin walls will dry quicker on the side grain, and two, the thinner walls will allow the whole bowl to warp slightly as it dries rather than form cracks. Now I did develop a small crack on the handle or the end grain portion of this bowl and that occurred in the last video when I was roughing out the outside of the bowl. It was unusually warm for early March in Ohio. It was in the mid 70s, sunny and windy. And in the few hours it took me to do the outside of the bowl, this end grain dried even though the middle portion of the bowl was still wet. That caused contracture like we just talked about. And because the middle of the bowl didn't allow this to contract, it developed a crack. Luckily it's just confined to the handle and shouldn't affect the rest of the bowl. If you do see a crack forming, it will generally be in the first few days of drying. And I generally don't advocate treating the cracks as soon as you see them. 
because remember they're forming because the end grain is dry but the middle of the bowl is not dry. But once the middle of the bowl catches up in dryness, generally the cracks will shrink and become tight. And that's what happened with this bowl. Now the other strategy to prevent cracking is to make sure you dry your bowl slowly. As the end grain dries, the moisture from the middle will get pulled to the drier end grain through osmotic pressure, but that's a really slow process. By slowing down the drying, as the end grain dries, the moisture from the middle can slowly come towards the end grain and it will lose moisture slow enough that you generally won't get any cracking. A cool place out of the sun and wind is ideal. I generally just put these in my garage. I usually carve in the cooler months here in Ohio, so the garage is usually around 45, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And then if you want to slow it down even more, you can wrap it in a sheet, or some people put it in uh, piles of wood chips. You generally don't want to leave it in any sort of plastic, however, because you're going to get mold on the bowl and it can be difficult to carve out in the finishing process. Okay, now back to the finishing cuts on the bowl. The goal here is to create a smooth finish with using very, very sharp instruments and just removing small amounts of wood at a time. Now for the bottom of the bowl, the convex portion, you have a few good options. What I'm using is this Swiss Made 5 slash 50 gouge. It has a very, very shallow sweep. It's a straight gouge. And because it has a sweep, it's going to have a little bit more of a tooled finish on the outside. Another option for the bottom or the convex portion of the bowl is to just have a flat across gouge. This is a Swiss made 1 slash 40, and that's going to give you a much more subtle finish. Third really good option I'm not going to do on this bowl is to use a spoke shave for this portion of the bowl. Now as far as technique, you're going to want some sort of workbench that's at or just below waist level. A heavy bench is ideal. I'm using just this portable bench because a lot of our stuff is in storage as we're moving. And the general idea is you want to use the larger muscle groups. So the way I like to do this is to put my hand at the end of the gouge to sort of extend this. Then I put my fist against my chest and then I just push through with my whole body. Now for the inside of the bowl, similar concepts apply, but instead of using straight gouges, you're going to want a bent gouge because you're not going to be able to reach the inside of the bowl without a bent gouge. Just like with the outside of the bowl, the amount of sweep you have on your gouge is going to dictate how subtle the carving marks are. So the more sweep you have, the more the marks are going to be seen, and the less sweep you have, the more subtle they're going to be. You do want to take into account what your bowl is going to be used for. If it's going to be a salad bowl, you want relatively subtle marks there because it'll make cleaning easier. But for a fruit or a decorative bowl, you can definitely have heavy carving marks and sometimes that's a nice look. Another option for the inside of the bowl, if you don't want any carving marks at all, is to use a curved scraper and just use that curved wood scraper to carve the rest of the inside of the bowl. That being said, those remove just a very small amount of wood at a time. So you're going to want to use your gouges and get a relatively good finish before you start using the scraper if that's the route you want to go. It's a beautiful spring morning. I'm going to keep carving and I'll get you back when we've made some progress. So I'm making a little bit of progress. I've pretty much done the convex portion of the bowl and I wanted to highlight two things. One is I haven't done the handles yet and I always do those after the main bulk of the bowl and that's because as your gouge comes down you go towards the handle so if you've spent a lot of time making the handle perfect you're probably going to ding into it as you're finishing the convex portion of the bowl. The other thing I've noticed about this wood in particular is it has a lot of very wavy grain and that does give you sometimes some pretty nice, almost tiger-striped figure, but it makes it very difficult to get a super smooth tooled finish because you're constantly dealing with changing grain direction. Next, I'm going to refine these handles, then I'm going to work on the rim, and then I'm going to decide what I'm going to do the inside of the bowl. To refine the handle area, 
going to need that bent gouge in order to make the turn. Now that I got the handles about where I want them, there's a little bit of warping to the rim here during the drying process. I'm just going to smooth that out, kind of level it out a little bit with the block plane. Okay, I got the inside where I want it to be. It's quite a lot of work with the scraper. One thing I'll say is if you are going to try to get a smooth inside with a scraper, you definitely want to get it pretty darn close with the gouge, otherwise you're going to be scraping for many, many days. The reason I ultimately decided to go with the inside with the scraper is I, I like the look of having this smooth on the inside and then having the tooled look on the outside. The other option to get some contrast is to do maybe fluting on the outside and then just have that gouge work on the inside. But overall I'm uh, happy with where we are so far and just a few more steps to go. Okay, last thing to do is the bottom. And you are going to get some warping, like we talked about, of the bottom area. And so if you set it on something flat and you do have some warping, just want to make sure that you're going to level it in a way that is going to keep these sides even. So just make sure you measure both sides, pick the orientation that keeps it pretty flat, and then level it to that plane. So I'm gonna be slowly leveling the bottom with the block plane, rechecking until I get it how I want it. Another method for leveling the bottom is to place some adhesive sandpaper on a flat block and then just move the bowl back and forth along the sandpaper until it levels out. You can also use this to mark the areas that are high and then move back to the block plane. So I got this seating pretty level now and I'm just gonna go and remove the rest of this oxidized portion. And then I'm going to create a ring that sort of stands proud from the rest of the bowl. And then we will be ready for finish. <coughs> Okay, it's finally time to put some finish on our bowl. And I figure I'd discuss what options you have and what I'm gonna ultimately do. So for most of my bowls in the past, my go-to has been the tried and true product line. I would usually start with a coat of their linseed oil only, allow that to cure, and then follow up with the original tried and true, which has some beeswax in it. Linseed oil is all natural. This is a food grade linseed oil and has a long history of being used on wooden cooking ware. That being said, I'm gonna try something a little bit different with this bowl and go with a tongue oil. This one's made by the Real Milk Paint Company. And the reason I ultimately made the decision to switch is this is a little bit more color stable, whereas the linseed oil tends to yellow and darken over time. And I wanna preserve some of the light character of this pear wood. Now, if you are gonna use tongue oil, you need to be very careful with what you buy because most of the tongue oil you can get at big box stores has little to no actual tongue oil in it and has a lot of harmful solvents and has a lot of varnish. I'm using this pure tongue oil and I've diluted it myself to 50% using a natural citrus oil solvent. But if you'd rather already have that work done for you, they sell a half and half version of this, which is half solvent, half tongue oil. One other thing about tongue oil is the rags that you use to apply it. They can heat up and even combust as the oil polymerizes. So two good options to deal with them is either to hang them out to dry afterwards and then dispose of them after they're fully polymerized, or you can just burn them in a wood burning fireplace. So without further ado, let's get the first coat of oil on this bowl. You want to apply a relatively thin coat so it can polymerize. I'm not sure if this is picking up on the camera, but there's some really nice kind of peach coloration to this wood. On the bottom of the bowl here with the facets, it just takes a little bit more rubbing to make sure you get good contact on all the wood. This is looking really nice. Let me move it into some better light and see if I can get some better footage for you guys. You can see the pear wood, the heartwood area is kind of a salmon color with a lighter color as you get towards the sapwood. wood. 
So now I just gotta have this dry. I'm actually gonna put it in a 170 degree oven to help facilitate the polymerization of this first layer. I'll heat it to 170 degrees, then just turn the oven off and leave the bowl in there overnight. I'll try to get some footage tomorrow so you can see what it looks like, and then we will work on a second cup. Thank you.